Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to this first meeting of 2021. A happy new year to everybody. And I'm sure that you all feel the same way as I do, that we sincerely hope that the situations in which we find ourselves at the moment will ease considerably during the course of the coming year. May I also extend a very warm welcome to the many guests who are joining us this, this meeting because of their specialist interest either in military postal history, in Canadian military postal history, or indeed uh, in relation to the Veterans Association of Canada. We welcome your attendance here and we hope that you will enjoy the meeting this afternoon. I do have one or two announcements, brief announcements to make before I introduce our, our guest speaker. Um, firstly, that uh, I think some of you already know that the presentation will be recorded and will appear on the RPSL website um, soon after the, after the meeting. That is the presentation itself. We're not, and the meeting itself proper, we're not recording the chat before and afterwards. Um, current circumstances have indicated that I need to make some further changes to my planned program. And those, some of them will appear in the next president's newsletter which will be distributed worldwide to all members tomorrow the 8th of january and they will also appear in the next issue of the london philatelist uh, which is due to be published at the beginning of february um, there will bound to be further changes to the program but all members will be notified as soon as possible moving on then to our presentation this afternoon. And I have very great pleasure indeed in welcoming our guest speaker, Sam Chu. He's a vice president of the Royal Philatelic Society of Canada and a fellow of that society, a fellow of the Royal Philatelic Society. His collecting interests are the postal history and stamps of China and Hong Kong, postal stationery, airmail, and various other themes, including frogs and bats, I'm told. Sam's a great exhibitor. He has received 31 large gold and 45 gold medals for his exhibits. He is an accredited judge of the Royal Philatelic Society of Canada and an FIP judge, both for postal history and postal stationery with jury fellow status. He also served two terms from 2006 to 2012 at Canada's Post, Canada Post's Stamp Advisory Committee. And in 2020, he became the editor of the Journal of Chinese Philately of the China Philatelic Society of London. And it's my, as I said, it's my great pleasure to welcome him today and to look forward to, with everyone else, to his display, Canada's Sea Force in Hong Kong. It's now over to you, Sam, and we welcome your presentation. Thank you. Did I get in? Well, you're not yet sharing, so. Um... Okay. Yeah, now you are. Perfect, Sam. Over okay. to you. Thank you very much. Before I start, I have to thank quite a few people. Uh, for example, uh, the Hong Kong Veterans Commemorative Association, the president, Mike Babin, and all the members joining. And also BNAS, where Charles Livermore had uh, decided to broadcast this. So thank you for, for, the, for the members of BNAPS, you, you know who you are, you know, uh, Peter McCarthy, my, you know, Mike Street, uh, even Earl Cove from Calgary, and also all the other military postal history society and study groups. So thank you for spending you know, your time uh, to listen to me sh sharing with you one of my collecting passions which is Canada's Sea Force in Hong Kong. I also want to wish everybody a happy new year. Now, 79 years ago, it was one of the darkest hours for Hong Kong. And unfortunately with it is about 2000 Canadian soldiers 
So this story is about them. I'm going to try to present a very, very brief introduction and follow with it is in chronological order, the postal history of the sea force. And we have to start with its forerunner, which when they were in Jamaica, they were the Y force. I'm going to show you only a couple of those. And the, uh, just as an explanation, uh, this particular show is 35 slides. I actually have a presentation of 118 slides, which I uh, greatly reduced to fit the format of this, this meeting. Now in that, there is a bigger portion of the Y Force stories. And after the Y Force Forum, after they left and they came back to Canada, and in, by September, um, by September 40, 40, they were asked to join and travel to Hong Kong, which started in October 1940. So en route to them, I'm going to show you another item that was sent from en route to Hong Kong, sent back to Canada. On arrival in Hong Kong, there is mail recorded from the Sea Force sending back to Canada. And after the war started on December the 8th, a, a lot of the mail did not get, did not depart from Hong Kong. And this is what we call detained mail, which I'm gonna show you some of those. And lastly, for uh, the two parts of it is after the war have started, uh, where Canadian, the relatives were sending mail to their loved ones and the POW mail as well. So as, as well as POW while they were in Hong Kong and Japan. Now, as I have indicated, I'm trying to use the social philately approach and to do so because I feel that that is the correct approach to tell the story. And I'm going to show you three particular correspondent that I have the good fortune of acquiring. I call myself only as a custodian because one day those should be left at a museum or whatever for further display. I, you know, when my motivation was that those should be kept intact and not scattered until somebody really appreciate the importance of that, which include the first one is the Benton and he's a Win Winnipeg Grenadier. The second is Dowling, and he's the Royal Canadian Corps of uh, Signals. Lastly, uh, from the Royal Rifles of Canada is, a, is Lester correspondent. What's in the name? We, you know, as you can see on the screen now, there's five different ways that this particular C4, 4C have been referred to, and they usually you know, all of those refer to the same thing. We start off with the Y Force in Jamaica. And when they returned in September, 1941, they, um, they had maybe a month in, in Canada before they were called back on duty to be sent to Hong Kong. Now, Canada sent two battalions with the Winnipeg Grenadiers and the Royal Rifles of Canada. So as you can see from the slides, around 2,000 men set sail in two different ships. One is the uh, Awati and the other one is a Prince Robert, which is a much smaller ship of which only 150 men was there. They left Vancouver on October 27th and stopped in Hawaii and Manila just briefly before reaching Hong Kong in November the 16th, 1941. The politics and the history of why the, this two battalion was sent to Hong Kong, I'm going to skip because of time, but there is a lot of material on the website as well as the Hong Kong Veterans Commemorative Association, which shows something like 40 books. And there's a lot of reading material. 
just so so you could refer to it at any time. Now, I just want to point to you where the majority of the Winnipeg Grenadiers and the Royal Rifles were stationed, essentially in two halves of Hong Kong. And where this line joins is roughly the two separate, the two separate high points of Hong Kong. And in between is the Wang Lai Chung Gap and the Jardin Lookout. The, the Jardin Lookout. So this is where a lot of lives, Canadian lives were lost. And the Japanese obviously know that they have to capture this and they then were able to cut the north and south, east and west communication routes. And my terrible memory, I cannot tell you exactly how many troops are on the Japanese side, but the superiority is roughly, you know, is at least 100%, if not more. And that includes some of the, the defenders who are really not soldiers. I'm going to start off, you, a lot of the description on the slides will be a description of the sensor and then from what we could decipher, the, the receiver and the, 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 sorry, the sensor and the sender. So this is an exception. So the, this, the, the postal history start off with the Y Force. Now the Y Force, as we knew, arrived in Jamaica, Kingston, Jamaica, because by then the British forces who were stationed in, in Jamaica was called back to the British out to defend themselves because of the start of the war. So there was nobody to tend the jails and so on. And Canada sent in the Winnipeg Grenadier to do so. This is an exception where when they first arrived, there was no rules and regulations stating that the sender must put their names somewhere on the cover. And uh, so we don't know who the, the sender is. And unfortunately as well, I cannot find any reference to this major click. So this is an exception. Later on, the development was much, the development of the postal system was much more developed where I could, for example, from the receiver sims i was a, and then you could see on the back his name i could trace it to private sims exactly where the company and so on you know c company of the winnipeg grenadier and by then this is a really well developed uh military sensor marking with the with the name of the officer which is major breed uh, beard that uh, is stamped on. Now, I was lucky enough to be able to buy one of the letters from, uh, with, with a, you know, to the Department of National Defense. Uh, and it has very, very important content to me because it mentioned a specific act that this particular person, which is the, the military censor is George Twish. Now I had the good fortune of being able to buy a commemorative booklet of the Winnipeg Grenadiers. And I have on the first row, on the first row, this particular person is George Twish. Now in the commemorative booklet, we have all the soldiers and listed men in, in group photos, plus all the officers in big photos. So we know a lot, of, a lot of them by their looks on it. So now, what, this is what we know about George Twish and uh, he was interned in all three camps. And uh, the other part when before I bought the letter, it was already highlighted in red. And what it says was that the big deal that he was complaining was the Jamaican, the Jamaican custom people were charging 
customs uh, duty on imported cigarettes from Canada for the men. So he's making a big fuss on that. Now, already mentioned that en route, the two ships stopped by Hawaii and then it stopped by the Manila before it got to Hong Kong. On November the 2nd, which you can see on the marking on here, November the 2nd, Royal Rifles of Canada. This particular cover was sent while the ships arrived in Hawaii. And it was probably sent in Hawaii and onward back to Windsor in Quebec. It took a merely 15 days. So I, I'm not sure if it went airmail one way or the other. So, but this is, this is a pretty scarce animal. And Royal Rifles of Canada, this particular marking belongs to the orderly room in one of the ships. The other one, in the there's a corresponding one from the Royal Rifles, I mean, the Winnipeg Grenadiers, which unfortunately, I have not the good fortune of buying. I have not seen it offer. And there is also mail that is taken off the ship when it got into Manila. I have f copies of that, but never been offered any material from that. So what we see is this is by sent by Rifleman Mirror of RLC, and it was censored by Lieutenant McDougal. On arrival in Hong Kong, my good friend and advisor, Mr. Richard Whittington, he may be joining us here, has the, you know, is very generous to me because he's the one who is doing all the censor of the, the British triangular markings while in Hong Kong. And we, we, now, we know that on November the 16th, the Winnipeg, uh, the, the Winnipeg Grenadiers and the Royal Rifles arrived in Hong Kong. The first record of mail that was sent from those two were November the 21st. It actually took five, six days before the mail were, were the first mail was recorded. So, and this particular cover sent on November 28th, November 28th, is actually carried on the very last service transport leaving Hong Kong before the Japanese invasion. It was on November 29th. So as you can see, there was very few days between November 21st and November 28th that mail for the soldiers who have arrived in Hong Kong got out. After that, that's another story because those were stuck in Hong Kong. So the, this is another cover that was sent on the very last, um, this was also sent on the very last service transport. Now we know that this was censored by Lieutenant Kerrigan. As you may appreciate, a lot of this, even though it's 79 years after the fact, we are just getting some of the stories. So I recently read on the Hong Kong Veterans Commemorative <clears throat> Association that Lieutenant Corrigan actually become befriend with another person who was a Hong Kong resident in the POW camp and they become good friends. And Lieutenant Corrigan's four daughters in Canada uh, met up with some with this particular person. And of course, there's a story that uh, came with it. So this is evolving. We're just learning a lot of things, even though this is 80 years after the fact. Now, the writer, Private Alex, William Alex Callas, he was killed in action on uh, December 21st. I should correct myself. He was missing in action, which means his body was never identified 
And uh, we know of what the Japanese did to some of the body, which is unmentionable. And that was in the same area where high ranking Major Grisham and Master Sergeant Osborne, J.R. Osborne, who is the first recipient of the Victoria Cross in the Battle of Hong Kong, and, and the, only, the only Canadian who get a VC in, in Hong Kong. So just, as, you know, just to mention for those who, who are not necessarily collectors and postal historians, that sometimes we don't appreciate that you, know, you look at a cover, but for us postal historians, there is much more to it. And I'm trying to show you that from this, we could decipher a lot of things, the sender, and then eventually when we do research, we find out the story behind it. So uh, this particular one was censored by Lieutenant Young. So, and, and he was killed in action again on December 21st. Because the Japanese, even though the Japanese started on the 8th, and they captured the Kowloon Peninsula on the 11th. They waited until the 19th to then cross the harbor to occupy the, try to fight for the Hong Kong Island. So be, the, the most fierce battle is between December 19th to de December 21st, where a lot of Canadian lives were lost. And um, and this one, the, uh, the private George Ernest Smith is the sender of this. Now, what we know is that the Japanese, after a while in 42, selected strong POW and then forced them to travel to Japan to work in mines, refinery, in the shipyards, coal mines, and so on. So. Uh, there is a description of Hong Kong BDC that, uh, you know, Private Smith really never recovered from this and uh, he passed away in 1966. As for a postal historian, the fact that this particular cover, a detained cover, was then re has a receiving mark is very rare. Now, just aside, I have a one frame exhibit that have won several one frame grants and been to the Champion of Champions uh, show. And this is on this particular marking, detained in Hong Kong by the Japanese from December 41 to September 45. This marking in two different colors were applied to mail. From record, there is seven bags of mail that was left behind. We know for a fact that the Japanese looted, you know, there's no registered mail. Uh, they looted everything. With registered mail, they probably was open up to see if there's any valuable in there and so on. And the seven bags are in particular are those that was frank with British or Hong Kong or anybody who, any country that are treated as enemy were detained in Hong Kong. This particular cover is actually a pair. My good friend, when I bought it, my good friend asked for one. So, you know, he has the other one, which is nearly identical and sent on, again as well on the seventh. So the Japanese, um, because we already mentioned on November 29th, is the, that was the last ship that carry mail eastbound they, because there's ships that carry mail westbound. And that's a different story because those wouldn't be Canadian mail. So this, uh, you know, Major Breer, uh, he's the second highest ranking officer that I have on record. I was told there, you know, at the Colonel rank, there are covers that the, they self censor. And I have certainly not seen anything of the Brigadier General's mail at all. You know, in a 2016 meeting with uh, Sergeant McDonnell, you know, I was lucky enough to met one of the relatives of the Brigadier who said he, the Brigadier's uh, 
material is still intact, but the one, the person holding it is not releasing anything or any of this for anybody to research or look at. So the last detained cover, which from a postal historian view is of special interest because it actually have two strikes. Now I've been trying to keep senses of um, the markings uh, of the detained cover, even though uh, Richard Whittington is taking over and he's doing a much better job than I did. Now, my, my observation is that the, this particular, the, the person who applied this probably thought this is now upside down. We better put a marking right side up on the back. The triangular marking, just to mention, uh, the, the British Army triangular marking, 136 is assigned to the Royal Rifles of Canada. 137, as you could see here, it was sent just for the uh, Winnipeg Grenadier, and 138 is for the headquarters staff. Let's take a look at mail that was sent by the families to the soldiers when they were in Hong Kong. This particular cover, there is another one sent 20 days earlier on October the 7th. <coughs> Excuse me. And both of them never made it to Hong Kong. And they were trapped in Ottawa and eventually sent back. So uh, as you can see, October 31st, the ships departed from Vancouver on October 27th. Family sent one from October 31st, and by then it did not reach Hong Kong because it probably was, by the time it got to Ottawa and so on, it, no, on November the 3rd, and it was dispatched, Hong Kong have already been in battle. Ken Ellison have the other cover, and this is this particular cover is from Lieutenant Brickley, and he passed away, you know, very uh, in September 1998. So he lived a very long life, and from what I could count, there he's one of the 22 lieutenants in the Royal Rifles of Canada. What this particular cover shows us is that a lot of the family members who send mail to you know, before the war, they never reach Hong Kong. After the war, then we have very specific instruction where the family should be sending and addressing the mail. So we see this particular pair that was sent to Private Vernier of the Royal Rifles. And uh, one is one was sent on May the 5th, the other one is May 15. And from record, we know he was wounded and eventually he was awarded the military medal after the war. For postal historian, we could, there's a lot of information in here. Besides the censor tape, where we could trace where it is from, we actually see the POW, sense, the POW camp sensor marking. For those of us who could read Chinese or Japanese for that matter, it actually says Hong Kong POW sensor. And on the bottom is the Japanese sensor marking. And this particular one is Namori. There's over a dozen of different sensor of which there is only six that has been found on military mail of 4C. This is probably one of the way where the POW mail has been forward to is there was two exchange of the ship, the Grisham, on one side, the LI side, and on the Japanese side is the Tia Maru. If you're interested in this particular story, there was a particular occupant in this, and you could find it in christianfiction.com. 
So this two exchange is where you know, Japan and the rest of the world agree on both exchanging male and civilian on both sides. What I forgot to mention when I said 1975 men, there should have been included in there two women who were nurses that went to Hong Kong with the two battalions. And on this particular exchange, the two women from Hong, the two nurses was sent back to Canada. So now for postal historian, we collect or postal stationary collector, which I am, we are particularly interested in collecting postal stationery. During the earlier days, the postal, the POW stationery was actually a cover. Now, I guess in later days, you know, the invaders thought this is, you know, this is too troublesome. We would only issue cards, postcards that they could easily censor. Well, this particular one, this is pretty scarce. And uh, so this was sent to, this was sent by, sent to by Rifleman Martin. And he was recorded wounded in action. And again, he was able to come back and die in pre- at old age in 1998. This particular card, which you, you saw earlier before my talk was, this was sent by, you know, Crawford. Now he is, he is the highest ranking medical officer that was sent over with the, uh, the two battalions. And just as a side, take a look at this particular card. It actually have two sensors. So the Japanese was really meticulous. Once you get a high ranking, they better make sure that there is no secret that's been transferred. And there is two sensor that went through this card before it was sent. Another side story to this is that, you know, uh, Crawford was made to, made to speak in the recording, which was then broadcast on Radio Tokyo over. Now, there is around 15 people in the Western state who heard about this broadcast and which they eventually contact Crawford's wife. For mail that is going from Canada to Hong Kong, um, by then, there, you know, as a postal historian, we try to track what is the earliest and what's the latest, and if there's any transition. Now, this particular one is, you know, again, from the information, S. S resembles the Samsung boat camp. Once it gets into Hong Kong, there's probably somebody sorting the mail and trying to direct it to the right camp where the receiver was. Of particular interest is this generic marking, which just say, sensor. And again, this is Nomori on it. This is, to me, this is a very early marking where the Hong Kong sensor haven't got their act together, that they haven't made the specialized stamp, which says Hong Kong BOW camp. And fortunately for us, that the, the writer had written on the back, you could barely see it, the receiving date on it, which was, which was a year later in 43. Now, there was a comment earlier in the discussion that how much of the mail were received. And this is what we know from description. The Japanese deliberately trying to demoralize the POWs. So in front of their camp, they would have piles of mail coming from Canada and they would burn it. And they would loot the packages that were sent and uh, which they would use themselves or sell. So this is really touch and go. We don't necessarily have a, you know, a census of how many got, you know, how much. This is the first time that I heard that one of the occupant of the, one of the, for C member have something like a hundred letters. Because to me, a lot of them got no mail 
And as you can see from later from my two correspondents, the, num the typical number is probably four or five pieces. Now this particular cover, even though it's addressed to a POW in Hong Kong, but what it tells us is this particular POW by then, by late 42, was shipped to Japan because of two things. The marking, which say Showa, and it's equivalent to 1943, October 17, and the generic POW marking without a sensor it's chopped on it. So this particular you know, rifleman, Gage, was probably of very good health. And then he was moved to Japan and he worked at the port as well as the mining. So again, he was able to come back, live a very healthy life until 1996. Now, this is the social philately part that I think would be a better treatment for showing if I was ever to show this particular topic. Uh, past President Chris King was in Toronto and he made a presentation of what non-philatelic material that should be included in an exhibit. And this is where I brought in what I think should also be in an exhibit. This particular one, I, I, I bought this collection I bought around 20 years ago is from Pyford, Private Benton of the Winnipeg Grenadiers. The t details of it, you could also you know, see that from the, uh, the website on Hong Kong BDC. Essentially he had been in several, several different camps and he stayed in Hong Kong for whatever reason. Again, he was able to live a very long life and only passed away in 2003. Just, you know, the 2003 date is, for me, I thought I bought this around 2000. So I don't know if the family sold this before his death. So in it was a bunch of photos. There is uh, around 10 of them. And this, this we know is him. So Private Benton in Winnipeg. But the only, I have no other photo of him while he was in Hong Kong. Now, until I think I found him, as you could see from the bottom, this is the helmet. So he, this was Benton arriving in Hong Kong and taking a photo of the, the iconic rickshaw puller in Hong Kong. Just to answer, uh, Gary, who Gary Tuppet, who just said that he knows of somebody who have a hundred pieces of mail. This particular correspondent, which to me this is a typical number where the POW only receive around. They only were able to send five, which they were able to send a lot, but how much went through and reached the family? This is five of them. So this is a, a typical sample of what a POW family would have. For us postal stationary collectors, we then could tell from the font of the French, not English, I was told, as well as the Chinese and the or Japanese, the different font. So we could, this is a type three POW car, and this is a type one. Unfortunately, the type two is not here. And you could see again, you know, Masuda, you know, uh, Hasegawa. So you know, different sensor marking on it, as well as you know, arrival in, in Canada, the sensor marking. This was a uh, stamp was not, not necessary because it, this is POW. So notice, notice the, the writing on all of them. They're very similar. They're very similar, it's printed. Let's take a look at the back of those four. And then one of them will stand out. As you can see, a lot of them don't have any dates. So we don't necessarily know what the order is. But when I so found those, I kind of sorted out in what I think was the order of what the family received it as. Now, take a look at this particular one, the handwriting is shockingly different from the other four. The other four, 
as you can see, are probably written by the same person who wrote the front. And from what we know, there are actually scribes at POW camps and a lot of camps. The reason why they're scribes is that they are much better handwriting, as you can see, very nicely printed. Uh, and meanwhile, I think, and at the you know later, I prove it proves that this is Benton's handwriting. The reason why is take a look at the two L's in all. In a much later date, I was able to buy a force Y cover from Benton. And where he, he wrote a mail, the two L's are the same. Now, the, the philatelic part of this collection is great, but there is a major component which I bought this particular collection of. And I said, I'm just a custodian. This have to be kept intact until it finds its true purpose. And Benton, for some unknown reason, on paper with pencil, recorded the casualty list of the Winnipeg Grenadiers from the officers down to the enlisted men. There is a total of four different such lists. The first one shown here is kill in action. On my back, you could see the second, the third, and the fourth. The second is also a KIA list of kill in action. The third one was MIA, so those soldiers' bodies was never recovered. And the last one was actually one that he entered every while well, after the December 25th capitulation of Hong Kong that the soldiers died while they were in POW camp or in activity. So to me, this is very important. And this is where the social philately comes in, where I think this is important to be displayed in an exhibit. A second collection. So what I really wanted in my collection was to show a, at least a sampling of all the three branches. What, why three branches? I thought you said Winnipeg Grenadiers and the Royal Rifles of Canada. Unknown to a lot of us that there is a third tiny unit, which are the HQ people, the headquarter people. And we, we've seen one, which is a medical corps. We have a Royal Signal. We have paymasters. We even have a post, you know, postal person in there. So there is a whole bunch of people. So I was very lucky enough to be able to buy this as he was a signalman. Now, what we know of, you know, this particular person is that this is a guess at this point, which may be updated because the research is ongoing. And as you can see from the next two slides, I have helpers on helping me. So he was records only from the HKVDC is that he was interned at some sort of camp and it did not show other camps that he was interned in, which now research have shown. So there are, this is a completely different orientation where those are the, from the family sent thing to Dowling. So Dowling have kept those cover and after the war brought it back so to keep intact. And again, as you can see from this and the next slide, there's a total of only four covers, which to me is another typical sign of that's all he received during his three years and eight months in captivity. Now, in an earlier slide, I was questioning what this BR means. The S I know is some sort of both. Now our IT chairman, Mark Bailey, I have to thank you profusely on doing this. Within a few hours when he saw this slide, Mark did the research for me 
and solve once and for all what this PL is. You know, I have tunnel vision because I was only looking at the camps that have the majority of Canadian soldiers in there. And I totally forgot that they may have been scattered elsewhere. And the Bowen BRs stand for Bowen Row, and it's a hospital. So Mark, within this few hours, so two days ago, this particular slide, slide have a question on what this BR is. So again, you could see on arrival, on arrival in Hong Kong, it has the the POW sensor marking in there. So BR by then, B, you know, Dowling was not in the BR camp. It was it was then he was then moved to some sort of camp. Now this particular cover of major interest in here is down here, the endorsement, SS Grisham. Already mentioned is that there was two exchange of mail. And unfortunately, I forgot to, I should really show the bottom, which says via New York. You know, in my research and in my sensor, I have only found this particular cover that specifically have the endorsement that this particular item was to be shipped by SS Grisham. So again, this has the BR cross out. So Born Row, he was not in the Born Row Hospital. He has since moved to S, which is a Samshui Bo camp. The last two philatelic, well, philatelic items in here are very similar. This particular cover, which was very similar to the one that I showed you earlier on the SS Grisham, this actually have no endorsement. But, uh, and I think this may be probably typical where, you know, it was sent there, the family doesn't know that it was going to through Grisham, so there was no endorsement. And the, this particular number, 5845, is probably, sorry, 5845 is probably a POW number that has been assigned. So I have to thank Mark Bailey for all his research and hard working. I have to pull my head out of the sand and uh, try to have a broad prospect to be a good researcher. One of the reasons why I bought this particular cover is this, those scarce animal, liberated prisoner of war, uh, aerogram. There are very few in existence. I, my uh, senses, I have not seen more than 20 of this, but I'm, I, sh I know they have, there should be much more in existence. So this was given, this was sent by family after they know that the, uh, the end of the war to this particular, of course, was sent to Dowling. You can see from the endorsement down here is Manila via Melbourne. And my fellow researcher thinks that this never went to Manila. It probably was waiting in Vancouver for their return. It, you know, so we would, we would not know. Another reason why I bought this particular one, this particular correspondent is the ephemera. Now we know that there is three types of this welcome home card. Those, as you can see, are prepared by the reception committee on return from the Winnipeg Grenadier to Winnipeg. There is, those cards were given and this particular one was given obviously to uh, Dowling. The other thing that I found most interesting is the notice. When they were in POW camp, a bilingual, one side English, the other side Japanese card was given not just to civilian, but also to uh, the military as well as to the Japanese soldier. Now Dowling have the foresight to put in pencil down on the corner that he received this on August 18th at 4 p.m. So now we have a record of when they were notified with these cards. 
But the real reason that I bought it is because of this notebook that Dowling has. And it's, it actually is made from POW stationery. I will show you, I will show you a, a selection of the card, uh, of the pages, which I would uh, at, at the end of this, but essentially those were, this is like a memory book, a, uh, you know, where all the addresses of the, the soldiers, not just Canadian soldiers, but also British internees, because there's over a thousand at some sort of camp that uh, he, he the, the, those as well as messages. Some of them were after the war and they were saying goodbye. And, but some of them were, were sent, they were written probably when they knew they were, were supposed to be shipped to Japan to work in those forced labor camp. So, the last correspondent that I have is from a member of RRC. Now, I don't know if you know, but one of the reasons why I like to present though, present, you know, my collecting passion is then people would know what you collect because I have shown a uh, similar presentation to do two different groups. In one, the last time I showed this, I actually show that I have a wish list. My wish list is to buy a similar, a similar collection of material, just like the Benton, just like the Dowling, but for a rifleman of the Royal Rifles of Canada. And Peter McCarthy is here uh, joining us and he is so generous. He let me have this particular correspondent and Peter, thank you for letting me have this. So this is what we knew, uh, we know of, uh, of Lester. And uh, he, was, he was in Stanley Hospital, but he wasn't killed in the massacre. So very lucky from him. And then he went through all the camps as well. And then eventually he was healthy enough. They ship him to Japan to work in the shipyard and eventually the mines. Now he passed away in 2003 as well. So it has five pieces of it, three covers and two letters. So again, the social philately part of it, I think the letters are important. The first, this is a com another completely different orientation where this is now the family receiving notices from the government. The first particular cover on the top shows January 7, 1942. The letter have since lost but I'm sure that the letter was a notice from the Royal Rifles, as you can see from the corner card, that telling Lester's father that his son was captured, not captured, his son was involved in the Battle of Hong Kong and they don't know what their status is because by January 7, there's no way in Canada they know who is alive and who's hurt and so on. There's the second piece on the corner is actually a follow-up letter, now October 31st. This particular one probably was received with a lot of joy because now his father knew that he uh, is alive. For the first time, you know, take to October 31st, that he's alive, he is put in a POW camp. The next two pieces is actually a set. I was, you know, Peter was fortunate enough to buy this time both the cover and the letter in it. So in the letter, as you can see, this is a much later date by July 1943, the Royal Rifles was contacted that Lester was being shipped to a camp in Tokyo. They only say camp. They didn't say it was a hot labor camp. The very last piece is from a buddy of Lester, who by then, this is November 45, so Lester had been repatriated and went home. As we can see from the corner, 
from the HKVCA website, Lester lived live a very long life. And, you know, that, that was before he passed away. Okay. Just as a summary, I, uh, I start off with a very brief introduction. Uh, you need to read up more on that. But the, I presented the, in chronological order, what we know of the postal history from its forerunners and so on. Then I presented three different correspondence from three different branches of the 4C, a completely different orientation. The Benton one are uh, five POW cards sent from Hong Kong to his family. Of value were the four pieces of handwritten casualty lists and to me and some of the photos of him in Jamaica, as well as the only one in Hong Kong. The second correspondent was the letters from the family, the, the relatives in Canada to Hong Kong, which we saw. And of value to me were the two LPW aerograms and the really rare, the welcome home card, as well as the notice of the POW civilian. Of course, it is the notebook that really should be exploded and explore and research more. Lastly, from the government point of view, the Leicester correspondent, what the Canadian government, at least the Royal Rifles of Canada, when and what they told the family. Now, before I end, I don't want to end this talk giving you that, you know, the impression that it was fertile for the Canadian soldiers to be in Hong Kong. Sergeant McDonnell, who is a, um, who is still alive, fortunately for us, there is still, according to Mike Babin, who's the president of HKVCA, there's still five living members of the uh, HKVC, uh, 4C. And uh, what some of the family have described is that during, after they came back, they were very quiet. None of them speak about the, the terrible experience that they have while they were in Hong Kong. But that changed in later life. And of, you know, Sergeant McDonnell then wrote three books of which one is the one soldier story. And the latest one was They Never Surrender. So this was at the book signing in, at the University of Toronto Library where I work. At, uh, and he mentioned one thing. And I, I think it's important to share with you because from what he is saying is that contemporary historians are now saying that there is evidence that this particular small force in Hong Kong have severely hamper the Japanese effort to conquer Hong Kong and to occupy Hong Kong. It was not a walk in the park in Hong Kong. Take a look at the dates. They start off with, on December the 8th. Kowloon capitulated on 11th, three days later. It took until the 19th for them to land on Hong Kong Island. And then it took until December the 25th before Hong Kong capitulated. They never surrendered, according to Sergeant McDonnell. McDonnell. So historians are now saying this is a severe delay for the Japanese, which they thought with their you know, soldier superiority, they could be a walk in the park, they could clean this out, and they could start going south to the rest of the Pacific Island. To the extent this delay have caused the, the U.S. was able to gather a force and in Solomon Island, and as we know, the Battle of Guadalcanal, which was as a turning point for the Pacific War. So the Canadian there made a difference. Now, before I end this, I want to thank everybody who took the time of, uh, 
of sharing my passion, but in particular the team at the Royal Royal in London. It's a joy to be working with smart people, organized, efficient. President Richard Stock is a joy to work with you. IT Chairman Mark Bailey, you are God sent. Thank you for doing my research and taking my head out of the tunnel. And Admin Manager Jason Weber, thank you for all your help. And Council Member Jack Jan. Now, the last thing I'm going to do is to show you what I did with some of the, uh, the Dowling book. M Mark, if you could share my uh, screen. Yeah, just a moment. Just bear with. So I have taken some photos so of the book, the notebook that Dowling has. So you could see there's even color pencil drawing, but there are messages. This particular red one was August 45, but a lot of it was actually the addresses. The addresses that I think most of them want to be contacted after the war. Thank you very much for your attention. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, back to you, Richard. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Sam, before we proceed to questions and the vote of thanks, uh, may I just say on behalf of everybody, my sincere appreciation, or our sincere appreciation, for all the hard work that you put into an absolutely magnificent display there are some phenomenal items in your collection. I particularly noted the casualty list. This is something which matches the battalion war diaries that were kept during the Great War and are now in the National Archives at Kew in London, or Kew in Surrey rather. And uh, those are all being digitized um, so that collectors and historians can access them. Also, you have placed in context, the need to include historical letters that were written at the time and also the ephemera that's so important to support a display of this type. And lastly, as far as um, actual ephemera is concerned, Dowling's notebook is absolutely incredible. I'll now uh, ask Mark to manage the questions. We do have 18 questions in the or we have comments some questions. in the chat. Yeah. Sorry? Yes, you're right. We have quite a few questions. You have quite yes. a few questions, so yes. I'll mute now and then hand over to you. Thank you, Richard. Yes, Sam. So uh, the first question is actually from Steve Jarvis, who says, uh, and this is in the context of the Y Force, he says, Sam, are you aware? of the Encyclopedia of Jamaican Philately, Volume 9, which covers military mail. He says it contains a chapter on the Canadian forces in Jamaica during World War II. Is that something that you're aware of? I'm aware of it. And uh, I only collected the first, I think there was four different forces of Y force going there at different times. Yes, I am. Thank you okay. for bringing that up. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Steve, indeed, for bringing that up. Now, Richard just now spoke about those lists of killed in action and missing in action. Um, John Cranmer is asking, uh, is, is the list of killed in action and, and missing in action uh, available online or elsewhere? Uh, at the Hong Kong VDC, you have the official book by uh, the Colonel. That's the official book. Is it Colonel Howe? Mike, help me, <laughs> my terrible memory. So there is an official recorded book in there and it's just pages of the names. So I haven't done my homework. I haven't compared this list to the one in there. So it is, it is available. And uh, of course, um, Mike, I mean, uh, Mark, if you like, I could blow up those four and you could put it on attached to my slides as well. 
Yeah, we could do that. Um, did you want Mike Babin to comment on that? Sure. Mike? Uh, hi, Sam. Thank you very much. Uh, terrific presentation. And for those of us who have family members who were part of C-Force, uh, it just provides us with a whole new perspective. Uh, so thank you very much. Regarding the question, um, on our website, hkvca.ca, there is an extensive amount of information about uh, the, uh, the members of C-Force. There is a complete list of those who were uh, killed in action, um, those who returned alive, which uh, POW camps they were kept at and so on. So I encourage you to have a look at that website, hkvca.ca. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, thank you, Mike, for helping answer that question. Um, really appreciate it. Um, now, actually, Sam, the next question comes from me. Um, <laughs> I'm taking them literally in the order that they're on here. That that pocket book that you have of um, Signalman Dowling, does the pocket book mention the time that he was at Bowen Road uh, Hospital? No, it doesn't, unfortunately. Okay. It doesn't, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Julian Bagwell um, mentions, because you mentioned the death of um, CSM John Osborne, who was awarded the VC for his very brave uh, act of uh, throwing himself over a hand grenade and therefore when it exploded, only he died. It didn't kill others around him. Um, there's a very moving memorial to his action um, and indeed uh, his death um, on the trail on, Jard on Jardine's lookout is what Julian's telling us. Moving on to another question. Um, Charles Oppenheim says, please excuse his ignorance, but he had no idea that officers could self-censor their letters home. What rank did you have to be to be allowed to self-censor? Uh, officer, so Lieutenant Upward. Okay. Thank you. Um, at the moment, that seems to be the final question. Everybody else has put some comments in there. Oh, hang on. No, there's a thank you, Bill. There's a there's a late arriving question from Bill Longley. Um, Bill's asks of uh, what is the number of soldiers male that exists? Well, yeah. Was My that... good friend Bill, I cannot tell you that because the other thing is that. Um, a lot of the family kept the mail. So, you know, it may not even be outside of the family. And until today, uh, you know, Gary was telling me that uh, somebody in Vancouver area, uh, the family has a hundred just for one particular, you know, soldier has a hundred, which I thought all along that, you know, typically they would get four or five. So mm -hmm. I have no idea. I, I, I suspect there's a massive amount still in family because it means something to them and they usually would not sell it for whatever reason. Yeah, I agree that um, basically the question that Bill is asking, which is about the number of different soldiers for whom mail exists. I, I think to be honest, Bill, that may never be known or certainly it'll take a very long time for it to be known for the reasons that, uh, that Sam has just outlined. Um, Bill, Bill then follows up with how many soldiers' names do you have recorded that received mail? Which perhaps is a an easier question to answer. Uh, I'm the not the one to do this because there I uh, to you know just as a disclaimer, my collection is not the best for C. You know, Ron McGuire's is the best for C, and that's what he aimed to do. But, you know, Ron wants to collect every soldier of force C. So he's the person, but unfortunately, Ron is uh, very hard to get hold of. So, you know, the information is not available. Okay. I uh, suspect at least a few hundred, you know, mm. at least a couple of hundred. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to invite Mike Street. Mike, you can unmute yourself. Uh, I think you'd like to say something to Sam, yeah? Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Sam, in July of 
2016, my wife and I uh, made a trip to the gas bay and after a, a long run, we pulled into the town and uh, went immediately to the McDonald's, which popped up on the first corner uh, to uh, take advantage of the facilities and have a coffee. We sat down and I, have, I looked over to the table adjacent and there were three uh, elderly people uh, in uh, blazers with medals and uh, Canadian Legion uh, badges. And because of my long association with Ron McGuire and Ken Ellison, um, I recognized immediately that one of them was a Hong Kong vet. So I, I had a chat with them. Uh, this gentleman, whose name I've forgotten now, um, uh, knew Ron McGuire and had corresponded with him. And uh, at that point, there were it was it was well, this gentleman was still alive. And I gathered that there were at least one or two more still alive in the Gas Bay area. Uh, it was quite an you know quite an end of a, a long drive, and uh, I, I won't forget it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, thank you for sharing that with us, Mike. Um, okay, well, there's no further questions other than Alan Baker's mentioned that he has a series of covers from Major Gresham from Jamaica. Some were censored by other officers and some were censored by Major Gresham himself, which also helps sort of answer the question, I think, about uh, officers who were able to do self-censorship. So I think, Mr. President, that was the final question uh, question about um, uh, that, that we've got here in the questions. So I'd like to pass back to you. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. And it's my pleasure now to invite Jack Zhang, a fellow of the society and a member of council to present the vote of thanks on our behalf. Over to you, Jack. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to address our respectful thanks to Sun on behalf of the Royal President. As uh, introduced by the President, Sun is a very respected, uh, famous, popular overseas Chinese philatelist in the world. First of all, let me say many, many congratulations to Sun on his wonderful, interesting, historical, and knowledgeable presentation today. Mm -hmm. I have to confess that I haven't heard the story about Seaforce before, so I have to express my sincere thanks to Sam for giving me, or maybe other members too, the opportunity to learn about this period of Hong Kong history. From the items he has shown us today, uh, we can see that Sam has an extraordinary election, collection of sea force materials. And that is why he can tell us the whole story relating to this small Canadian force in Hong Kong during World War II. Also, we understand both the importance and the pleasure of the philately. It is not only about the collection, attending exhibitions, competitions, etc. It evolves the history of the subject. It can remind us of what happened in the past and teach us how to learn the lesson from it. Today, I have learned, we have learned, I think, everybody has learned about the hardships Canadian soldiers experienced during World War II and historical, historical information historical information on the POW during this period, which may interest the families concerned and researchers. I think Sam has done a very deep research on these covers, letters, special marks, and the POW of Sea Force. The postal history items, such as the forerunner Wire force material in Jamaica, mail en route to Hong Kong, arrival in Hong Kong, 
detained mail, retained mail, and the POW mail in Hong Kong and Japan enable us to understand what happened to sea force after it was sent to Hong Kong just before Japan invaded Hong Kong, and also their experiences as POW in Hong Kong prison camps and in Japanese mines, ports, etc. I think some of the materials are very rare and useful for philatelists and of course also for historians, particularly the correspondences of Benton, Dowling, and Lester. I especially liked Mr. Dowling's handmade notebook in which I'm sure there is much more useful and historical <clears throat> information. To conclude my vote of thanks, I would like to use some words published in our Royal's Journal, the London Philatelist in December 1906. The intellectual and scientific aspect of philately has always been manifest to those engaged in the pursuit. But by these appreciations of the aims and ends of philately, the imprimatur of public recognition of science has been ensured, and the general public, the world all over, will accord to the philatelic student the full recognition that his studies are placed on the same footing as those of other intellectual and scientific bodies. Salem's study has proved this. Well done, Sam. Many thanks. And of course, I have to say thanks to Mark Bailey too for his contribution too. Uh, thank you very much to you all and happy new year. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, eloquent and excellent vote of thanks, Jack. Thank you. I'm very, very grateful to you on behalf of everybody. Thank you very much, President. Mark, do you yes. have the certificate available? I do. And just before I put that up, there is one last question that snuck in when I wasn't looking. And I think it's a good one just to ask. It's a quick answer. Sam? Sam? Yes. Do the postal stationery items that you mentioned, do they have any indication of value as in, you know, indicia? No, 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 no. Thank you. Absolutely nothing. Okay, no, thank you. Anyway, yes, as Richard asked me, I will put this up on the screen. We do make a presentation of a certificate. Um, this is the virtual version of it. You will in due course, Sam, receive this uh, in the mail uh, as a memento of your excellent and erudite presentation to everybody this afternoon. Okay, thank you. Right. I think that brings us to the end of the uh, proceedings this afternoon. May I just mention our next meeting on the 21st of January? Um, and that can be written down very quickly as 21 1 21. Um, and uh, that subject will be presented by Murray Abramson, and it will be on a specialist subject of his, the early commercial United States airmail via England onward to the British Empire between 1922 and 1941. And I hope to see as many members as possible to view that presentation in a fortnight's time. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, for joining us for this um, presentation this afternoon. And do keep safe and keep healthy I'm sure we're all, uh, well, we're not looking forward to further lockdown, but uh, um, any changes to uh, the proceeding to what happens in the near future will be the subject of uh, the first two or three paragraphs in my presidential uh, newsletters. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this afternoon. We will continue to chat informally for as long as 
uh, everybody wishes to do so.